Hi, I'm Orion Weiner. And I'm Andrew Houck. And today we'll be telling you about the role of membrane tension in organizing cell polarity that appears in the latest issue of Cell. So our lab is interested in the general question of how cells organize polarity in response to external cues. This critical ability in which cells restrict activity to specific regions of their surface is essential for many processes, ranging from the regulation of cell division to the formation of multicellular organisms like the wiring of the nervous system. Our lab studies polarity in human neutrophils. So these are cells in the innate immune system that hunt and kill bacteria and use directed migration to find external bacteria. In this movie, a couple of my own neutrophils are responding to a point source of chemotractant, which releases, releases bacterial-derived chemotractant. As we move the source of chemotractant around, the cells are able to very accurately and rapidly reorient their axis of migration to follow the, the source of the external chemotractant. Incredibly, neutrophils do not require a gradient of chemotractant in order to polarize. So in this image, we're visualizing sites of acne assembly, which is the process cells use to move in response to chemotractant. When we expose the cells to a uniform um, pulse of chemotractant, the cell initially responds with uniform activation throughout the cell surface. But if we wait a few seconds, activity disappears everywhere except for the morphologically dominant area of the leading edge. Under this, this state, the chemotractant is uniform, the ligand is uniform, the receptor is uniform, but the response is highly asymmetric. So how is the cell able to accomplish this polarized activity in response to a uniform input? Several different models have been proposed for how the cell might accomplish this. They basically involve the leading edge uh, exerting a long-range inhibition that prevents activation of other regions of its surface. And several different discrete classes of models have been proposed for how this long-range inhibition might be accomplished. In the first model, uh, postulates that there's some limited components of the polarity apparatus. Uh, so there's only enough machinery for a single leading edge to form. Once a leading edge forms, this nascent leading edge sequesters the limiting component and prevents other regions of the cell from responding. A second class of models is one that postulates the, the existence of a diffusible inhibitor. In this model, the leading edge secretes a poison which diffuses throughout the rest of the cell, spreads throughout the cell, and prevents activation elsewhere. So prior to our experiments, it was widely believed that one of these two classes of diffusive-based models underlied cell polarity. An alternative to these diffusion-based models is a model in which physical forces, rather than the movement of molecules, transmits information from front to back. In this tension-based model of polarization, the cell um, initially has a, a, a low tension in the cytoskeleton and or plasma membrane. Protrusion at the leading edge stretches this plasma membrane and or cytoskeleton. That tension is transmitted throughout the cell surface and that inhibits formation of secondary fronts and the spread of the existing front. In our experiments, we sought to, to perform experiments that discriminate between these many classes of polarization models without us requiring to know what the underlying molecular components involved in the process are. We used cell severing and cell morphological perturbations to push neutrophils into situations where existing diffusion-based polarity models break down. We verified this with computational simulations. This suggested to us that perhaps tension is, a long, is the dominant long-range inhibitory signal. To test whether tension increases are sufficient to inhibit signaling and leading edge protrusion, we increased tension with micropipette aspiration. We hypothesized that this would shut down leading edge signals and act in assembly and eliminate protrusion. In this movie, the, the leading edge signal rack is shown in green and cell morphology is overlaid in purple. The micropipette will come in from the right side. As soon as we aspirate here, rack activity is lost. Importantly, this aspiration effect is reversible. When we release suction pressure here, rack activity and protrusion resume. This demonstrates that tension is a long-range inhibitor. But is it essential to confine signals to the leading edge? To, to get at that, we decided to reduce membrane tension with a hypertonic buffer. We hypothesized that this would expand the zone of actin assembly, leading to uniform protrusion. Consistent with our hypothesis, reducing tension with a hypertonic buffer immediately causes uniform protrusion and uniform leading edge signals. This demonstrates that membrane tension is essential to confine signals to the leading edge, meaning that membrane tension is a dominant component of the long-range inhibitor. In summary, our data suggests that membrane tension 
rather than molecules generated or sequestered at the leading edge, diffusing to the back, is what constrains the spread of the existing front and prevents formation of secondary fronts. Our data on how cells polarize has significance for the general process of polarity. And because many diseases result from the misregulation of polarization, um, our data has significance for everything from cancer metastasis to atherosclerosis. For more information, we hope you'll check out our paper in the latest issue of Cell. Thanks.